Jai Gurudev. Today we will continue reading My Life, Its Legacy and Message by Pandit Sri Ram Sharma Acharya. Chapter 7 Revelation of the Technique of Sublime Transformation How I Implemented It in My Life Before I proceed further, it will be appropriate to describe three important phases of my life sadhana which are linked with my spiritual progress. This has been the central point of my successful life journey. If readers of this book are inspired to proceed on this path, they should assimilate the philosophy behind the sadhana which I have adopted in my life. Mysterious occult events no doubt sound interesting, but they are confined only to the person concerned. Hypnotized by such events, if a person performs the same rituals and pays a visit to the Himalayas, he will get nothing. The most important lesson which my soul has learned living in this body is true upasana, or worship. Correct life sadhana and aradhana, which means service of humanity. This is the path which can transform a person into a divinized human being, a rishi or a messenger of God. A man needs food, clothes, and shelter for sustenance. Pen, ink, and paper are needed for writing a book. Seed, manure, and water are needed for growing a crop. Not one, but all these three are important, and none of them can be ignored. For spiritual progress, also, coordination of upasana, sadhana, and aradhana is needed. All these three are equally important. The real form of upasana. The aspect which is secondary and minor, e.g. mechanical adoration, pujapath, has been wrongly considered to be upasana or worship. Offerings of some stray materials to the deity and doing certain rituals or overt acts of worship are considered as puja. To eulogize, extol and chant praises of gods is known as path. Sweets, coconuts, cardamom, etc. are presented and offered to God or the deity as if he lacked such articles and by offering them, he will be overwhelmed with joy. People think that just as a ruler is puffed up on hearing bardic poetry and his praise from a bard, God will fulfill their worldly desire by such adoration, pujapath. Such persons are totally ignorant about the true nature of Godhead and consider him to be a stupid superperson who could be allured or befooled like a child. They think that God can be coaxed to fulfill their desires, proper or improper, just or unjust. The common man is a victim of this illusion. The so-called bhaktas, or devotees, beg wealth, success, heaven, liberation, siddhis, or divine powers, from God. Some people are crazy after seeing God with physical eyes. Amongst persons who are engaged in counting beads or burning incense sticks, a majority belongs to this category. Some are after a still cheaper formula. They think that simply by seeing idols in the temple or having a darshan of saints, they can cajole them to fulfill their ambitions. Such naive beliefs are prevalent in the society. It should be clearly understood that a really worthwhile thing is bound to cost more. If a person wants to be included in the central cabinet, he has to get himself elected as a member of the parliament. The meaning of upasana is to sit close by. It is not like the railway passengers who jostle or push each other to get into the train somehow. It is like two bosom friends who have two bodies with one mind and one soul sitting together. In such intimacy, one has to surrender to the other. A devotee or bhakta has to mold his life and surrender himself to the will of God. Explaining the importance and philosophy of upasana, which is the first essential prerequisite for spiritual upliftment, Gurudev said, God cannot dance to your tune. You will have to become his devotee and act according to his will. If you are unable to do so, you will become identical with God. Fuel has no worth except when it embraces fire and becomes fire itself. Fire does not become fuel. It is fuel which has to be transformed into fire. A drain meets a river and becomes as purifying and great as the river itself. But it never happens that a river flows in reverse meets the drain, and becomes dirty like it. Iron comes in contact with Paras, the mystical stone which is said to convert iron into gold by mere touch, and turns into gold. It does not become Paras. It is the Sadak who has to dance the tune of God like a puppet. God does not fulfill the wishes of the Sadak. A Sadak has to surrender himself to God and fulfill his will. A drop of water merges into and becomes one with the ocean. The ocean does not become a drop. This is the philosophy of upasana. If a person wants to do upasana, he has to sit near God, 
do his will, and become his follower. I had to do the same. I worshipped God, performed Drap of Gayatri as Divine Mother, and meditated upon Savita as Divine Father. Throughout, I had only one feeling. Like Shravan Kumar, I would demand nothing from my parents but carry them on pilgrimage. I would mold my character in such a way that I may be called a worthy son of worthy parents. I did, no doubt, regard Gayatri as mother and Savita as father, for the sake of convenience of meditation, but knew throughout that they are formless, astral, and all-pervading. On account of this conviction, I could feel that they pervaded my whole being, and there was completely identity of spirit. If I had regarded God or Gayatri Mata as specific persons, a distance between us would have been maintained, and I had been deprived of that feeling of complete identification. In the beginning, for the sake of practice, one should regard himself as a creeper and God as a tree. The creeper embraces the tree and reaches the top. It is also convenient to regard oneself as a flute and God as the flute player to enable him to make his life disciplined and inspired. The meditation about a kite flying high up in the air with its controlling thread in the hands of a child is also helpful. I have followed these three types of meditation from time to time and had rich, enthusing, and happy experiences. The sacrifice of the moth on the burning lamp, physical, mental, and material surrender of the wife to her husband are instances of experiencing complete identification, unity, or oneness with the god. In my upasana, actions, rituals were not of primary significance. It was suffused with emotional zeal, devotion, and faith. I strictly followed the discipline of doing prescribed japa. Except for some emergency, rarely was there any omission in getting up in the morning at 1 a.m. and performing the set routine. Deficiency, if any, was made up on the next day, and nothing was left in arrears. Even then, I had practiced throughout to maintain an attitude full of emotional zeal during my upasana. In the beginning, the practice of arousing feelings of sacrifice, unity, identity, and negation of duality was done in the form of imagination. Later, it became a part of nature and ultimately culminated in self-realization. The power of Gayatri Mata started reflecting in the form of devotion, shraddha in casual body, illumination or pragya in astral body, and determination or nista in physical body. Strict self-introspection was done from time to time to ensure that this was no mere wishful thinking. I examined and analyzed myself in the light of actual daily events. Whether or not devotion for leading an idealistic life for the service of mankind as a whole had increased and allurement of temptation has been overcome, and found that my feelings had fully matured like those of a Rishi Kalpa Sadak. Gayatri Mata manifests as divine energy in feminine form. It took the form of Pragya and dominated the mental arena. I tested on several occasions to ascertain whether in the form of Pragya there was integration of wisdom, responsibility, and fearlessness down to the deepest depths of consciousness. I have been experiencing that Gayatri Mata has incarnated in the form of Pragya in my inner consciousness, and my upasana, meditation, and contemplation have all become fruitful. Whether or not our convictions or ideologies are reflected in our actions or karma, attitudes or gunas, and nature or swabhav is the real test of upasana. The third aspect of Tripada Gayatri is Nista. Nista means firm determination, patience, courage, bravery, and devout austerity or tap, and endurance. Just as a pot taken out from potter's kiln is thoroughly examined by thrashing and beating it with fingers to find out whether it is half-baked, broken, or fully baked and intact, in the same way I kept on introspecting and observing myself whether there had been any wavering in my firmness in the face of temptations and fear. I found that every step was an advance forward, and there was no stagnation in the progress. The brilliance of Savita is known as Brahma Varchas. It is also called Ojas, Tejas, and Varchas. It is reflected directly in the form of Paiti, sharpness and brilliance. The inrush of Savita's light in the physical, astral, and causal sheets fills the body with strength, the brain, with knowledge, and the heart with love and courage. Later, I started experiencing that my entire life had become a field of light. A column of fire and divine nectar was flowing through each and every cell of my body, my entire being. I felt I was getting the joy of contentment, fulfillment, and peace. 
as if I were drinking somnus or nectar. This, in brief, is my regular program of doing upasana for four hours daily. This period effortlessly flies without boredom, tiredness, yawning, as if only half an hour has passed. Every moment I feel heavenly joy and closeness to God. This has become a routine. I have no inclination to count, boast, or think of rewards or results. Like all other tasks of daily routine, sitting near God, or upasana, is also a natural living routine for me without which I cannot live for a single day. For me, doing upasana for a fixed period daily is a process of recharging myself with spiritual energies which keep me full of divine bliss throughout the day. I spend every moment blissfully experiencing myself in God and God in me. In such a state of inner consciousness, one takes the ups and downs of life in one stride. There is neither joy nor sorrow. An undulating ocean of bliss appears all around. Wherever I look, I see God. He walks beside me wherever I go. I feel his presence every moment like a guardian angel, like a pilot. An ocean cannot become a drop, but there is no doubt about a drop becoming an ocean by merging its ident identity in the ocean. An attitude of carefreeness and fearlessness spontaneously grows with the awareness of God's constant pre presence. I have cherished firm faith, or shraddha, in the divine throughout my life, which has helped my soul in getting united with God. It is revealing and manifesting itself in the form of actual Bhagavati, mother aspect of divinity. Never failing sadhana. Man has his own limitations like a child. He potentially gets infinite strength from his creator, the omnipotent God. This, however, is conditional. Children do not know proper utility of objects and, can and cannot take care of them, so they are given cheap toys, petty balloons, rattles, whistles, lemon juice, toffees, etc. When a child grows up, understands his responsibilities, he gets everything in inheritance without demanding anything. For this, he is not required to beg, beseech, pathetically, or offer prayers. God and divinized human beings are keen to give a thousand times more than what we ask for, provided we have demonstrated our competence to utilize the divine gifts for noble and altruistic purposes and not for gratification of our perversely petty, egoistic desires and hungers. It does not serve any purpose to give false assurances for the future. Proof has to be furnished how. Whatever has been given so far has been utilized. This is the basis of preparing the history sheet, which is examined before promotion is granted. I had to give convincing proof of my competence and sincerity during past several births. When everything was found to be in order, gifts and grace were showered on me. Whatever Sugriv, Vibhishan, Sudhama, Arjun got, and whatever they did was not the result of their own ego-centered efforts. The supreme power of God was working behind. Canals get water from rivers. Distributaries which supply water to the fields get it from the canals. If there is any disorder or mishap anywhere, there is bound to be a breakdown in the entire chain. Man can establish intimate relationship with God on some definite basis. There is no scope in it for anything like flattery. God does not play a favorite with anyone. He is bound by the laws underlying the smooth workings of his cosmos. He is impartial. My personal competence is almost insignificant. Whatever has been accomplished should purely be considered the result of divine grace, most of which is being showered not directly, but through the medium of my Gurudev, although it hardly makes any difference. How could this sublime achievement be possible? It was possible by cultivation of competence or worthiness. It is also known as Jivan Sadhana. It is intimately related to Upasana. Electric current flows through a metal wire and not through wood. A dry log of wood burns far more quickly and brighter than a wet one. A mother takes up a child into her lap when he is neat and clean. If he is stained with filth and dirt, she will first wash and clean him, and then take him in her lap and feed him. For securing nearness, proximity to God, purity of character is a must. Several persons had remained soiled with carnal cravings in their previous lives, but the moment they took to faith, devotion, and sadhana, their lives were transformed beyond recognition. Valmiki, Angulimal, Bilva Mangal, Ajamil became saints in the true sense of the term the moment they surrendered themselves to God, although their past lives were far from pious. 
We adopt the policy of Ram Nam Japana Pariya Mal Apana, mechanically taking Ram's name but coveting what belongs to others. We go on doing evil deeds and symbolic acts. We will escape from retribution for our trespasses. Is this not a great delusion? Before dying, a cloth has to be washed. Before sowing it, it is necessary to plow the land. To earn the grace of God, one has to lead a pious life and become a sadhak. A sadhak alone can become a true devotee. In the absence of jivan sadhana, the thoughts, character, diet, and daily routine of a person will all be disorganized. Such a person will always remain restless on account of greed and desires, and he will never be able to concentrate his mind. No purpose is served merely by performing karma kund and symbolic worship. Worship is directly related to inner feelings. With such sublimated feelings alone, a person is able to assimilate righteousness in his attitudes, actions, and nature. When a respectable guest pays a visit or there is a function, the entire house is cleaned and whitewashed. If God is to be invited to occupy the chamber of the heart, it has to be first cleaned of all the dirt and dross which fill it. For this one has to take recourse to self-introspection, self-purification, and self-transformation, along with self-growth. These facts were explained to me, and I thoroughly assimilated to them. After all, why do we lead a contemptible life? Greed, delusion, and pride, these three are at its root. A man having these vices is bound to be dragged towards hell. Actions are shaped by our subtle tendencies. Our physical body is governed by our mind. The mind alone, and not the body, should be considered responsible for all the misdeeds. Keeping this fact in the view, I considered it appropriate to cut the root of the poisonous tree and started Jivan Sadhana, considering mind as the basis. Crimes are often committed due to economic compulsions and temptation. A pledge was, therefore, taken by me to lead a simple life of an average Indian. Whatever the income, it should be spent on economically according to local conditions on the principle of simple living and high thinking. In principle, most of the people give it lip support, but when it comes to practice, they find it difficult to do so. It requires unshakable firmness and resolve, as members of the family have also to be prepared to follow it strictly not only in principle, but also in practice. The greatest difficulty in this connection is about the attitudes prevalent in the society. People think that when everybody is indulging in riotous merrymaking on his well-earned or ill-gotten wealth, why should we exercise control on ourselves? It is very difficult to convince members of the family in this matter. Still, if we practice what we preach and try to convince people by logic, facts, and results, and our resolve is firm, it is well nigh impossible that persons close to us will not be influenced. If economic malpractices are sought to be eradicated, it is necessary to educate the minds of the people on these lines. With this belief, I remained firm in my convictions. Our family in Ghia Mandi Madura consisted of five members till we came to Haridwar in 1971. We managed our expenses within 200 rupees per month. This could be possible by thrift and by maintaining a standard different from others. Although my income was above average, as I had inherited ancestral property, it was also spent in the education of children, of other members of the family, and nothing was accumulated to breed vices and addictions. Thus, an important aspect of Jeevan Sadhana could be practiced. A man has a propensity for adorning, embellishing, and enriching one's own family, and he wants to leave huge wealth in succession at the time of his death. Children of the people who indulge in, under, in unrestrained gratification of desires are bound to become addicted to luxuries of all sorts, and thus a chain of extravagance and squandering of money starts. Ill-gotten wealth is bound to be spent in licentious living. I learned a lesson from the experience of the downfall of others and did not allow such an outlook to enter into my home. Thus, a cultured, refined family grew up. People squander away a lot of money and time in bragging, pomp and show, ornamentation and fashion. There was no scope in my life for such ego-inflating and self-glorifying trivialities, as an atmosphere of Brahmana-like politeness and simplicity was maintained throughout my personal and family life. We had formed the habit of doing all domestic chores with our own hands. For years, Mataji grinded flour at home and prepared meals herself for the family and guests. 
a domestic servant had to be engaged only when, on account of extraordinary expansion of missions work. It became difficult for her to spare time for her household work. It is a false notion, born out of a perverted sense of values, that those living in pomp and show are regarded great, while those living in simplicity are considered to be unlucky or backward. It did not ever apply in my case. It would have been a different matter if poverty had become our law on account of sloth or incompetence. But in our case, it was a voluntarily and gladly adopted way of life in adherence to high and noble ethical principles. None of my relatives, friends, etc., who came in my contact regarded it as poverty, but as an example of setting Brahmana traditions. There are people who, by giving up chilies or putting up wooden sandals, make loud proclamations of their simplicity and righteousness. But spiritual life is truly lived by an all-inclusive self-restraint and discipline in which one has to consciously endeavor every moment to transform his entire way of life into that of a true brahmana. This entails a gradual and long sadhana. In this respect, I rigorously trained myself and also all of those who are linked with me. Life is affected by accumulated evil tendencies and habits. Passion, anger, greed, delusion, pride, and jealousy all tried to deflect me from their righteous path, but they were chased away before they could establish a foothold in my psyche. They succeed only when a person is caught unawares or lowers his guard. I kept a constant watch on my attitudes, guna, my actions, karma, and my nature, swabhav, with a view to ensuring that righteousness of a sadhak has been incorporated in them. It is a matter of satisfaction that I can humbly claim to have emerged victorious. At birth, everybody is crude and unpolished. Every soul brings with it, from previous lives, more or less load of evil tendencies and impressions. They are not eradicated all of a sudden. The grace of the Guru or Puja Bhat, rituals, also does not serve this purpose. The only way is to struggle hard against the evil tendencies. A parallel army of noble thoughts, duly trained, should be kept in readiness to fight it out as soon as an evil thought creeps in. Evil thoughts and tendencies cannot exist for long if they are not allowed to consolidate their position in our minds. Their strength is limited. They mainly depend on habits and conventions, while good thoughts have always the strong support of logic, facts, proof, wisdom, etc. The authors of ancient scriptures have rightly pointed out that ultimately, truth alone prevails. In other words, it is the divine virtues and noble tendencies that form part of our real higher nature. Evil tendencies are only aberrations and shadows without substance. When monkeys and bears can be trained to display amazing feats, there is no reason why a raw and crude mind could not be refined and made righteous through concentrated sadhana. Ardhana that was uninterruptedly pursued The confluence of Ganga, Yamuna, and Saraswati is known as Triveni. It is said that one who takes bath in it is rejuvenated. Although a heron cannot become a swan, a crow cannot become a cuckoo, it is certain that the inner and outer life of a man can be totally transformed by the confluence of triple currents of upasana, sadhana, and aradhana. These are not rituals to be performed in a particular manner or at a particular time, but are instruments for bringing about high-level transformations in man's thinking, character, and behavior. For this, it is necessary to keep a constant watch on one's physical and mental activities. Vigilance has to be exercised to eradicate vices. High idealism has to be incorporated in our attitudes, actions, and natures to restrain them, just as wild animals and birds are trained to display skillful feats in a circus. Upasana, or worship, can be done for a short time, but sadhana has to be done constantly, just as an infant has to be watched continuously. Only an upasana, which is coupled with sadhana, becomes fruitful. Those who consider puja, or upasana, a mere jugglery and indulge in daydream to attain riddhis or siddhis by performing this or that ritually are totally under a delusion. Gurudev had on the very first day clearly indicated to me the mode of Tripada Gayatri in the form of upasana, sadhana, and aradhana. He pointed out that along with regular job and meditation, there should be permutation of upasana and sadhak's thinking and feelings. Sadhana in his character and aradhana in his social behavior with faith and alertness. I have so far implicitly complied with these instructions, and the results achieved thereby are there for all to see. 
Aradidna means remaining engrossed in doing work for public weal. Jivan Sadhana is a sadhana of self-restraint or sanyam, in which maximum is saved and minimum is spent on one's own sustenance. Only that much time, labor, money, and talents are used on one's own person and family, which could ensure a simple, dignified life of the standard of an average citizen. Measured against this criterion, a hard-working and educated person should be in a position to save something after meeting his essential needs. Best utilization of this saving is known as radna. Ordinarily, people misspend the saving on themselves or members of their families because it does not occur to them that there are other persons also in this world who have their own needs. If their outlook had been altruistic, they would have utilized their savings in works of public good and fulfilled the needs of the times. God is convinced, conceived as Sakar with form for the purpose of meditation according to one's liking and belief, and it resembles a human figure. This conception is definitely essential and useful, but it has to be borne in mind that it is imaginary and not real. God is one and cannot have so many forms as have been visualized by various religions and sects. The utility of form should be kept confined to practicing concentration of mind. The principle underlying idol worship is that effort should be made to understand, visualize, and assimilate the invisible God through the medium of a visible symbol. The omnipotent God can only be nirakar or formless. God is known as Paramatma, which means that which includes and exceeds all living beings, Jivatmas. It is Virat Brahma or Virat Vishva, Sri Krishna had shown a vision of this cosmic or universal God to Arjun and Yashoda. Kaushalya and Kakubushindi had also seen a glimpse of God in the form of the entire universe. According to this conception, public service becomes a radna of Virad Brahma. Man has been sent by God as his prince and has been endowed with the precious life to make this universe a garden of God, happy and prosperous. The significance of human life lies in fulfillment of this aim, which is known as radna. I have been doing this out of the twelve hours of night, four hours were spent regularly in upasana, and the rest in sleep and other daily routine. If a person is lazy and careless, his whole time is spent haphazardly and in a disorganized way. But if he fee girds up his loins, remains vigilant, marvelous works can be accomplished. During 12 hours of the day, leaving 2 hours for food, rest, and other routine, a net period of 10 hours remains in hand. I have been using this period of the day regularly in doing work for the welfare of the people. These activities of Aradna can be classified as under writing and publication of magazines, books, literature, etc. for refinement of the, the minds and attitudes of the people in accordance with the ideals of Yuxitna. To inspire and provide guidance to truly aspiring souls to adopt a way of life in accordance with Yugdharma, needs of the time spirit. To give advice to those who have turned to me for guidance and counseling, for elevating their souls, to enable them to overcome their personal difficulties and build a happy future based on high principles. Innumerable persons came in my contact, and a majority of them were changed, enlightened, and benefited. It is not possible to describe the events and mention the names of such persons, since it is not my habit to do so. Moreover, it will become a voluminous book, even if only certain events which I still remember are reduced into writing. But the persons concerned may object to it. The practice of expressing gratitude is almost extinct now. It will, therefore, not be proper on my part to say anything about these events. Besides, by disclosing the bounty of good deeds, the efficacy of the virtue gets diminished. There is, however, no doubt that these services have been very effective. Up till now, 1989, more than 24 lakh persons are associated with Pragya Parivar. However, the number of those who have been deeply influenced by the principles and ideals of the mission would have been around one-third. Majority of them consists of those persons who have received enlightenment, affection, help, advice, and divine gifts from me in their personal life. They had come rushing to me greatly worried and afflicted with grave problems and returned with solace and peace. This is the reason that such a large family has been built up. If it was all based on mere ideology and principles, the membership of Gayatri Parivar would have remained limited.
like Arya Samaj and Servo Daya Samaj, and the atmosphere of personal intimacy and cordiality would not have been established. There had been much pressure on Mataji on account of Russia visitors, their arrival at odd times, and in making arrangements for their stay, food, etc. Despite all these inconveniences, we have been amply rewarded by the affection and love which we have earned in return. All that we have done for the people is being repaid with interest in the form of this affection and love. Thus, it cannot be said to be a losing proposition. Capital is needed for a radhana or public service. How can a person who is hungry himself distribute food to others? Where from would this capital come? Gurudev had told me on the very first day of my meeting with him, Whatever you possess, learn to sow it in the form of seed in the field of Supreme God, the Virat Brahma. On sowing, one grain is bound to multiply 100 times. Gurudev quoted the instance of Jalaram Baba, who was a cultivator. He used to spend all his savings in feeding the needy. God was extremely pleased with him and gave him such a per perennial bag, the contents of which never got exhausted. Free Kitchen, which he started, is still working at Virpur, a village in Gujarat, in which thousands of devoted people take food every day. A person who invests his money for public weed gets ready and glad cooperation. However, a person who accumulates, keeps his money unused, and goes on amassing more and more is always cursed and ridiculed by the people. Under Gurudev's direction, I decided to surrender my always. 1. Under competence to do physical labor, capacity to do mental work, 3. Sentiments and feelings, and 4. Ancestral property at the feet of God. There was nothing self-earned. I applied all the aforesaid four gold wealth with deep faith and devotion for specific purposes, and the return was a hundred times more. I did physical work for 12 hours daily and never got tired. My efficiency, on the other hand, went on increasing. Even at this old age, I have the capacity to work as hard as a young man. Both mental and physical work were done side by side, and old age has never adversely affected my work and morale. I have immensely loved people, and have been in return profusely loved by them. Besides getting personal affection, respect, and goodwill, people wholeheartedly respond to my appeals for working for the mission. An outstanding example of this is construction of 2,400 Pragya Pitas within a short period of two years. In the beginning, I started with my own money. Gayatri Tapogumi was built with the money I got by disposing of my ancestral property. In my place of birth, a high school was built. Later, a Sakti Pita was also constructed there. I had little hope that people will give so much without expecting anything in return. The complex of Gayatri Tapobhumi, Madura, Shanti Kunj, Gayatri Tirtha, and Brahmavarcha's research institute at Haridwar are examples of the fact that on being sown, a seed multiplies by a hundred times. Due to lack of faith, people conceal what they have in their possession, beg for donations, and pray God that they may win a lottery. If a beginning is made with complete self-surrender, the result is bound to be astonishing. A devotee who built the Sakti Pita, Gayatri Temple, at Junagar in Gujarat, made a beginning by selling his utensils. It is preeminent amongst all the Sakti Pitas which have been built so far. A grain of Bajra or maize on being sown ripens and multiplies into 100 grains. This has actually happened with me when I sacrificed all I had. Members of the family should be maintained as long as they are not able to earn their livelihood. To go on spending money, labor, and intelligence on able-bodied and earning family members and die Leaving property in an inheritance for them is immoral, and I have always opposed it. Money which comes unearned or gratis is ill-gotten, although it may be ancestral, having kept complete faith in this ideal. I did not allow my wealth in the form of physical and mental labor, emotional feelings, and accumulated savings to pass on to the hands of undeserving persons. It was totally applied in Aradhana of God, towards the growth of nobility and goodness in society. The result is self-evident. If, like a miser, I had used all my resources in self-gratification, hoarding, or in spending on members of the family to make them multi-millionaires, it would have all been wasted. One has to wait for the next birth for getting results of certain virtuous deeds, righteous actions.
Public service, however, is such a universal good whose reward one gets instantly. We feel deep soul satisfaction in consoling others in the moment of their despair. There is a divine rule that the store of the benefactor never becomes empty. God's grace always blesses him, and whatever has been spent comes back multiplied manifold. Sheep parts with its wool, but it gets new wool every year. Trees yield fruits, but their branches again get loaded with fresh fruits every season. Clouds go on raining, but they never get emptied as they go on collecting water from the ocean. The coffers of magnanimous persons never get empty. It is a different matter if a person donates his time, labor, and resources to undeserving persons and blindly encourages evil tendencies and considers it to be a righteous deed. Otherwise, public service is bound to be instantly rewarded. Whosoever invests in this enterprise is bound to be rewarded by soul satisfaction, public respect, and divine grace. Misers are those who foolishly boast of their shrewdness and cleverness, but great is their loss in the ultimate analysis. Public service loses its significance when, in return, a man expects to get name and fame. It then becomes a business, like publication of an advertisement in the papers. If a person is reminded of the favor done or something is expected in return, the efficacy of virtuousness is lost. Donations given under pressure do not fulfill the true aims of charitable purpose. The criterion is whether by such an act there is growth of kindly feelings and spread of righteous tendencies. These days, innumerable ostentations and hypocrisies are in vogue which promote the growth of social parasites, who exploit simple people by fraudulent and deceitful means. Before spending any money, a man should think a thousand times what its ultimate use will be. It is absolutely necessary these days to execute such far-sighted wisdom. On such occasions, I have decided to oblige and even dared to incur the ignominy of being dubbed as inconsiderate. One can have a glimpse of the philosophy of my life in these three aspects of Upasana, Sadhana, and Aradhana. This is the path which has been followed by all the great ones who have achieved their goals and earned fame. There is no shortcut on this path. End of chapter 7. Jai Gurudev.